so we're back to concert going this week. All very exciting for everybody. Now, you both, Richard and Charlotte, went to the same concert yesterday, although not actually the same concert. <laughs> one in the afternoon, one in the evening. London Symphony Orchestra at the Barbican. I'm not expecting you to deliver your review. Richard, I know you're going to be doing that officially for someone. But uh, how was the actual experience, um, the technically actually getting around all of the restrictions, if there, if there were that many? Um, Richard, how did you find that? Well, um, it's still the mask, isn't it? Um, I, I'm not a big fan of those, but, you know, we have to do it, so we do do it. Um, bit of a queue, actually, it was okay. Bit of hand wash, pictures with scanners. Um, pretty straightforward, really, and then we're just all sitting one seat apart. The seats are nice and big at the barbican, aren't they? So mm. there's your social distancing built in already, which is quite handy. Yes, I, I always think social distancing because it actually sounds like quite a nice idea. <laughs> I really hate being crammed up in, in, in next to lots of people. I know that's particularly the case in... London theatres where I mean I can barely sit because I'm six foot tall I can barely fit in the seat anyway let alone next to other people whose who's, my knees end up encroaching on their knees it's absolutely crazy it's a little bit better in concert halls what about you Charlotte how did you find it I mean yeah, yeah masks not great for a whole well, evening's experience no I guess not but we're used to masks now aren't, aren't we so I don't think it's really such a hardship and actually I was surprised at how normal it all felt I mean the queue it was barely a queue. I mean, admittedly, there were slightly fewer people at the 3.30 showing, but it was still, I mean, it all moved fast. Um, anybody who has been anywhere over the past month or so is already used to signing their NHS um, tracker app at the right, um, whatever it is, the barcode. And it was just wonderful to be back. Um, I was surprised at how normal it all felt. And of course, talk about socially distanced seating, the Barbican, it's those annoying seats, they're wonderful, but you can't put your stuff underneath. So to be able to put <laughs> yes. your stuff on the seat next to it, I, I felt <laughs> guilty even liking the fact that we had the social socially distanced because I mean, it was a luxurious, but mm. obviously for the LSO themselves, I mean, it doesn't make financial sense. And so we need to get to a point very soon when we can fill all of the seats. No, although I, I quite like the idea of, and I, the CBSO have been doing matinees for, for ages for, for a sp particular um, demographic in Symphony Hall very successfully. But I do like this idea of doing a slightly shorter concert and doing it twice in the day. Yeah, yeah so do I. And, and also for me, I mean, I was really frustrated yesterday because my daughter at secondary school would normally have a half day on um on a wednesday and if it had been on a wednesday i would have been able to take her to the concert mm. and and that that's a really wonderful thing to be able to go to you know a grown-up in inverted commas at 3 30 a concert that i can take my teenager to mm. so i'm all in favor of that continuing actually i think we could do brilliant things and perhaps richard helps a little bit with people who have to travel further i know you went to the evening one last night but you you traveled down to london from litchfield there, there are going to be a lot of people who do want to see stuff in London and are often hampered uh, because, especially on Sunday, sometimes the, the travel isn't there. And particularly right now, when people don't really want to be on busy trains as well. Well, it's, it, it, it's, it is a real thing. I mean, I was um, worrying about um, tonight I'm going to an opera house. It actually occurs to me, perhaps with reduced train schedules, I might not actually be able to get home. Mm. Um, it looks to be OK. But um, yeah, there's definitely something nice about being able to get home as a reason, you know, before midnight from central London. Um, yeah. And to have time for a bite to eat as well, you know, that's that's it. Um, you know, it's all part of it's, that's what we've missed, isn't it? That whole package, the whole night out, the whole evening. And the, yeah, um, the slightly earlier times I, I found work quite well. It was quite a, a good program, though, quite a long program, nearly a full length concert almost without an interval. You know, mm. 40 minutes worth of Dvorak Slavonic dances and then two 20 minute pieces prior to that. Um, it was certainly good value. I mean, sooner or later, Lou Breaks are going to have to make a comeback, though. And <laughs> let's, see, let's see how that plays out. <laughs> Absolutely. All but right. we definitely yeah. weren't getting a half a concert. It was, no, it was no. a proper, yeah. well proper thought, job. So. Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's get on with the podcast. This is the Classical Top 5. I'm Tommy Pearson with Richard Bratby and Charlotte Gardner. Today we're discussing game changers, those moments when something, a piece, a performance, a recording, an event, whatever, changed our view or perception of it forever. 
in the creative industries, if we're lucky and have open ears and minds, we get quite a few game changing moments in our lives. So I wonder what we'll come up with uh, in what will undoubtedly be a very personal edition of the show. Charlotte? Well, my first choice is actually yesterday's concert. Um, and so I'll do that one first, given that we've just spoken about it. Um, it was the sheer wonder of hearing a live orchestra again. Um, and as you know, predominantly I am a recordings rather than a concert critic. That is what I do the most of at any rate. Um, I mean, recordings are wonderful, um, but they are a complement to live music, not a replacement. And yesterday just brought home to me the fact that music was created by composers to be an exchange uh, for an audience to react to and for the musicians to see the reaction. And um, it also, just as the Britain's Young Person's Guide to the Orchestra got to its big climax and the tears flowed as I knew they would, I remembered that... I've spoken on Classical Top 5 before how the moment when I decided that perhaps I should be a music critic, a music journalist, because you just couldn't top this, was Simon Rattle conducting the City of Birmingham Symphony over 20 years ago, ago as I sat in the Corn Exchange. And, and I remembered that as such a sort of a sensory overload of feeling the air vibrating around me, feeling the floorboards under my feet as they trumpeted out Marla 5. And so there was a wonderful mirroring to have Simon Rattle conducting now the, the orchestra from my hometown um, after 14 months of not having heard any symphony music. And I was just absolutely wonderful. And it was the same sensory overload. I mean, it was such a, a luminously tactile thing. It was so technicolored, you felt you could almost touch it, the vibrations in the air. I mean, I've, I've never, I can't oh, remember. even in the Barbican. Yes. Well, this is it. I mean, I had never, le <laughs> I've never heard flutes sounding so dually three-dimensional or cello pizzicato sounding so tangibly plump. Or there was a moment in the third um, Slavonic dance when the violins slurred lines. They were kind of sounding like luminous rainbow ribbons being spun in the air. And, you know, I've never done drugs, but I'm told that things seem bigger, more beautiful, you know, more sensory. And, and that was like it was. It, it was like I'd just taken the biggest hit on something. So I'm told. Um, and it, I, I think it was accentuated as well by the fact that the orchestra was, of course, halfway out into the room because this was a socially distanced orchestra. The stage had to come out fuller. And so they genuinely, they weren't being swallowed up by that proscenium, proscenium arch either. There was more sound reaching us. Um, and I just, I'm, I'm never going to take an orchestral sound for granted ever again. But honestly, the sound of those flutes when they came in in the Britain, I, it just, I've, I've still got them ringing in my head. See, this, this is what slightly worries me about, about the whole situation is that there's such an excitement about returning to the concert hall. I worry, I mean, I know you're not delivering a review uh, other than the one you just did, Charlotte, mm. but um, I worry I that... I paid for my ticket, in fact. Uh, which is uh, fantastic. A but uh, paid for <laughs> <their> ticket. <laughs> amazing. Um, but um, uh, on the other hand, there, there, there is a, a tendency out there, I think, a little bit at the moment, as, as to feel like a lot of critics feel like they're representing the industry. And if they say anything negative about it, um, the, the, they're going to be attacked for it. What everyone needs to do is to say rally and say, isn't it fantastic that everyone's back? And of course, it is fantastic everyone's back. But that means, mustn't mean that critics lose their critical edge because that's their job. And it's been nice, for example, to read Richard Morrison in The Times this week talking uh, uh, in those terms uh, and uh, really taking everything for what it actually is. I have to say that although I, was, I wasn't there, of course, yesterday at the concert, but uh, some of the things I've seen online, I don't think the orchestra has necessarily been or an orchestra has been necessarily that um, convinced by the gaps between the sections and all the rest of it. They don't, I don't, I haven't felt always that it's worked because of that. It's incredibly hard for musicians to play that distance to part. They're so used to homogenous sound coming from the distance that they're used to. But anyway, um, yeah, I mean, I, concerts can really have that effect on you though, can't they, Richard? There's, there's got to be moments where you've been in a concert or and just thought, actually that really does change things for me well, well like like i said memory lane isn't it I, I started thinking um when was the first time i really got the whole thing about live music i mean i had recordings in my family home from as long as i can remember um classical recordings it's a great 
great love of my father's. He had a good, you know, impressive record collection, the Schulte Ring Cycle, you know, um, Bolt conducting the planets, all sorts of things, you know, um, Viennese overtures with Carrie Anne, you know, the, the Willy Boskowski's Johann Strauss sets, all these things would just come out on Sunday afternoons. Klemper conducting Mozart, they'd come out, they'd be put on, they'd be dusted off in this ritual, they'd be put on the turntable, and, you know, the house would fill with the summer sunlight. I'd smell the roast dinner on its way from the kitchen, and it's <laughs> lovely music. And it's, you know, that's it's part of life. Um, the, the live experience. I mean, my parents took me to live concerts at the Liverpool Philharmonic um, when I was a child. And I, when I was very young, I didn't quite get what was going on. I sense it's a bit different in the trees. Lots of interesting things to look at, lots of interesting things to see here. I don't really remember the music itself making much of an impact or kind of knowing kind of how I was supposed to respond at that age. That it's just very interesting watching all the musicians going out their business. The moment when it did make an impact, I think was a, um, I think I must have been about 11 or 12 and a school schools concerts by the Royal Liverpool Philharmonic Orchestra and um, I was playing the cello by this point um, and I was quite impressed I was, you know I, I knew something about classical music and I was going to hear this and I was telling all my schoolmates what, what it's going to be like but I'd not actually been to an orchestral concert much in my life at that point um, and we got there and we got positioned in the balcony at the Philharmonic Hall in Liverpool it's this gorgeous art deco auditorium these sweeping white curves we we're there at the top of the balcony looking down at the orchestra underneath this Hollywood Bowl style auditorium they have there and um, I can't remember who the conductor was. I didn't really think, I didn't, I wasn't aware that sort of thing mattered at that point. He's just a man with a stick. Um, but he came on and wham, it's Ruslan Ludmilla overture, um, Glinka, straight into it. First orchestral sound I heard was like, hit me. Wow. <laughs> the energy, <laughs> the excitement, the wall of sound. That's the moment I remember. I thought, well, this is amazing. And um, I'm, I'm going to have to have more of this. And I think that, that was the moment it caught me. That was the moment the bug bit. Um, it's that piece. I wish I knew who conducted it. I could probably go back through their schedules and find that <laughs> concert, but uh, it never felt necessary. It was the music. It was the moment. It was the impact of the orchestra. And the lovely thing about that hall, um, the Philharmonic Hall in Liverpool, again, like some older concert halls, it's built in the late 30s, um, is it does have this physical presence to the sound. Um, the air wobbles. Um, Symphony Hall Birmingham, where I've spent a lot of my professional career, is superb in many ways, but it's quite pristine. And it can deal with any sound that's thrown at it. The Philharmonic Hall Liverpool is a bit more compressed, or at least it was then. The air wobbles. You feel the physical impact. You feel your tummy rumble as the basses play at the bottom of their string. And you feel that kind of whoomph of the, the kind of the, the, the shockwave hit you as a music roars up from the orchestra and sort of slams into the front of the balcony and i and that, that's what i i loved that's what i you know that's what excited me that's what i wanted more of at that point you know what you know what's wonderful about about that description which is it's so similar um uh, your description of a concert what 30 something odd years ago uh to charlotte's description of yeah. yesterday's concert after yes. all these hundreds and hundreds of concerts that, that, you, that you've out. been through that you can still it's, have that freshness and, and that returning to the concert all after over a year is almost like a rebirth for you. I mean, you've, you've, you've got to be open to that, haven't you? You've got to be open to that yeah. sensation, to that moment. I mean, I mean, I don't know, Charlotte, if um, where the performance I attended, you went at 3.30, I went at 6.30, and at 6.30, Rattle gave a little speech. He probably gave the same speech Yeah, to you, he I gave it know, to us, too, yeah. Saying about, um, they've been playing in the same hall, for maybe doing recordings, online stuff, playing into silence, but when there's an audience there, it's a different quality of silence. It's a completely mm. different kind of silence. It's a more living, more pregnant thing, and it's, it's that exchange. And uh, you always have to be open, I think, because you know, as a critic, it's easy to get jaded, um, but you have to be open to that just experience of the moment uh, to, to be well, thrilled, you, you, to be surprised. You're open to it, but actually, it's when you don't expect it that's the most exciting, isn't it? I mean, especially it I think, is. especially yeah. if you are a regular concert goer, and not that it becomes mundane, but it has to be extra special to really catch your ear. And I, that's what I, I love. And actually, I'm, I'm rather jealous of you, uh, Richard, remembering your first concert, because I was desperately trying to. And actually, wow. I really I really can't, because I, you know, I've been going to concerts for as long as I can remember and beyond that, with my, my parents taking me to, to things when I was very, very young. And I think I have memories of some things, when actually it turns out I really just, I, I've, I know the programme booklet and I remember that. So that's what trips it off in, in my memory. I was desperately trying to think of a very, very early orchestral experiences that I'd had. But I honestly, there's so many, and I don't think I can really pick them out. They're, they're come from a little bit later in, in my life what i've picked out is a cd and i say a cd very specifically rather than a recording because this is from the mid 80s when cds had just started to appear uh, properly in in the shops rather than just for the for the uh, connoisseurs and uh, wh smith's in maidstone was the only place that had cds at this particular point i was at school 
And so, and I just started having a allowance uh, from my parents, which sounds very grand, but it wasn't very, wasn't very much, but I tell you something, the money came out of that wall and uh, well, and that was it. I didn't have to give it back. It was extraordinary. I should have been buying clothes, of course, and food, but I didn't. I bought CDs, uh, as you would expect. Um, and in the little rack, because uh, it, it was tiny. I mean, when you think now, uh, or, or at least it used to, you know, big places like HMV with like thousands and thousands and thousands of racks of, of CDs. This was just one tiny little, almost hidden bit of W. H. Smith's behind all the books and the, and the stationery and all the rest of it. Uh, and I just sit there sifting through these and trying to decide out of the sort of maybe, I mean, honestly, it can't have been more than 30 CDs available um, to choose from. But there was this CD and it's called Movie Music. And it was the LSO conducted by Stanley Black, great Stanley <laughs> Black. Um, and it was, it's this from, it was recorded in 1987. So I was 16. So by this point, I was already into film music quite a lot. Um, I've been going to the cinema obviously since I was a child, but um, the, uh, and I lo always loved the music, but I hadn't really made the sort of transition, if you like, to uh, what well, I suppose you might refer to as film music geek or something along those lines. Um, but this was the CD that did it. I bought the CD uh, and of course was immediately impressed by the amazing sound, you know, as we all were when the CDs came about, you know, it took a few years before we realized it was actually rather horrible and it took some time before engineers figured it out and made CDs much, much better. But at that point, it was just a digital transfer and it sounded amazing. But actually, this was this was tremendous uh, CD packed full of the, uh, you know, all the big, big um, um, themes from from movies like, you know, all the great John Williams ones like Raiders of the Lost Ark, Star Wars, Superman, things like that. Lawrence of Arabia by Maurice Shah. Uh, and it also had a very uh, intriguing, I assume, put together by Stanley Black, intriguing little mix of the beginning of Alzo Sprach's Zarathustra by Richard Strauss, as in the beginning of 2001, that then sort of harps and stringed its way into the waltzes of Johann Strauss <laughs> and it was rather rather neatly done I thought so a little a little sweet from uh, from the movie that is uh, but and then it finished with this spectacular medley from James Bond movies um, arranged definitely arranged by by Stanley Black um, trumpet led tunes um, with people like um, John Barclay and also the great Morris Murphy so this was the sound of the other side I was I, I knew already but this was with um, with movie music uh, in, a, in a sort of compact form on the disc. Loved it. And it really was the thing that started me properly on this road to film music that I'm now totally immersed in, uh, in that world. It was that one CD. It was the first CD I bought. Um, and from that, you know, I, I, I started saving up and, and buying more CDs and adding them to my collection uh, to the point now where I have to have a separate storage unit to keep them. But, uh, you know, that was where it all started, that one CD. And by the way, very importantly, I bought it before I had a CD player. So for a few, <laughs> few months, I had the CD in my hand, but no means to play it. I was just too excited to get it. It was like it was going to disappear from the shop and I'd never see it again. So I had to get it. Uh, mm. Then uh, a friend of mine got me a... Uh, a Walkman CD. It was the very first Sony Walkman CD. If I'd kept it, who knows how much it would be worth now. <laughs> but uh, so I used to sit there with my headphones and, and, and listen to that. But that's really what started me on this whole um, obsession with film music was that one CD. It's great. It's still available, by the way. It's reissued every now and then. I think it's actually on the LSO's own label now because I think they own the recording. But um, anybody got any recordings uh, yeah. that they'd like to pick out? Yeah, Charlotte? Well, not actually a recording, but the moment when recordings became important for me. This is uh -huh. this, this works nicely off the back of yours. So the work that woke me up to the power of a classical recording and to the idea of listening to a classical recording for fun. I've said before on Classical Top 5, um, I grew up playing music, but aside from Peter and the Wolf um, record and a Mozart hits cassette, I wasn't listening to it, largely because I wasn't surrounded by people who listened to it. My parents were listening to the Rolling Stones, Manfred Mann and Abba in the evenings. My teachers weren't Interesting saying... Interesting mix. Yeah, it was, yes. Um, and my, my teachers weren't saying, going, go and listen to this. They, Yeah, it, it was strange. So I, <laughs> I had this upbringing based entirely around amateur music making, what I happened to be playing in my lessons or county youth orchestra. I wasn't listening to music played by the pros, essentially, either on stage or on record. 
Um, and any recordings I heard were in the academic domain. It was listen to this piece of music and describe what you're hearing, write it down, music GCSE, that sort of thing. So I had never heard anyone speak of a classical recording with love and reverence and awe. They literally weren't on my radar. I was listening to you too. Um, and then music A level happened. And first of all, music got a bit more interesting. My love affair with Brahms happened. Symphony number no. four was my featured work, um, set work. But um, we were doing this Ravel and Debussy section of um, A level. And I had a very lazy music A level teacher. Um, he really, he didn't want to be a teacher. He wanted to be an arranger and put on concerts. Um, oh. So at every moment he could think of, he would give us a worksheet or something to read or a recording, and then he'd scuttle out of the room and do what he wanted to do in his office, normally a bit of arranging for school choir. And, and so it happened that one morning, um, it was the first, it was the, it was the lesson before break, and he wanted to bunk off early, and we were doing Ravel and Debussy, and he said, okay, I'm just going to put this on, you can listen to this. And it was the slow movement of Ravel's piano concerto. And... I was just absolutely transfixed. I have no idea what recording it was, but the beauty, I mean, you, Tommy, you've spoken about this before on Classical Top 5, this, the utter perfection of that score, the fact that there isn't, there isn't one extraneous note, mm. every note is in exactly the right piece. It is, it's a perfect piece of music. And, and for me, it was just the sheer beauty of it. Um, I know the bell for the break went, and I thought, well, stuff that, I'm not moving. I've no idea whether my classmate moved. I literally, she fades completely out of the consciousness. All I can remember is sitting at the desk, thinking I am sitting here until the end and seeing, and I have this image in my head of sort of the silent slow motion of watching people pass by the netball courts outside of the window as this Ravel played. I, it was just such a powerful memory. And, and that was it. Afterwards, I was in the library. I was taking out Ravel CDs to rip them off onto cassette. I was going to the music shop and buying not just the piano music I was supposed to be playing in my lesson, but getting out um, G major piano concerto slow movement transcription, Ravel and Menuet Antique from Tombeau de Couperin. And, and then I went, I got my student loan and I went into Heffers and I bought my first CD, which was the Ravel G major with Jean-Yves Thibaudet playing it. Mm. And it, it, it was all off the back of that lazy music teacher putting on Ravel. And, and this is another reason actually why I get very, very cross when trendy teachers and music journalists bang on about how boring and narrow the GCSE and A-level music set works lists are, arguing for less run-of-the-mill choices, more diversity. They're seeing things through the blinkers of knowing stuff. And for me, what school is about is making sure that everybody has the architectural foundations to then go ahead and what they do what they want to do. You have to find out about the major names and how they formed musical history after them. I mean, it's like trying to teach somebody about music and get them to write knowledgeably about music without having learned about Beethoven and Ravel and Bach first. It's a bit like trying to teach somebody how to compose without first teaching them the basic principles of tonal Western harmony and counterpoint. And so I feel so strongly with my musical background. And, and it was that Ravel that just kicked everything off for me. Oh, I'm looking forward to you becoming uh, Secretary of State for Education, Charlotte. That would be <laughs> very nice to see that sort of thing happening in schools. Talking about music teachers, I mean, um, <laughs> it, it's funny, isn't it? I mean, you know, we, we hear a lot about inspirational music teachers. There are so many out there. There are so many out there. I mean, I, I just sound like Charlotte had one particularly. <laughs> and, uh, our music teacher was, was, a, was an eccentric sort of chap who... Um, um, we had a, we had an evening when you talk about potential A levels. I decided I want to have a go at music A level uh, because I want to take take my interest to the next level. Um, he he kept saying, "Well, it's really for the expert enthusiasts." He kept repeating this phrase: "It's for the expert enthusiasts." Um, it's for the expert enthusiasts. It became clear once I started the course that what he meant by this was, um, "You're going to be teaching yourself." <laughs> he handed us a syllabus and said, "Well, here's what you are. Here's what there is. Let us let me know what you want to find out." Um, <laughs> basically uh, there's all sorts of things on there you know um at that time you had to be able to harmonize uh, Bach chorales uh, now I couldn't play a keyboard instrument I still can't play a keyboard instrument and uh, if you couldn't play a keyboard instrument my, my teacher was pretty much stumped as to how to teach you how to do this you could either sit at the piano and you show you how to do it or you you couldn't do it you simply have to try and work it out like algebra which I kind of fumbled my way through and did um but you know he, he's more interested in talking about Liverpool Football Club and its recent results um than about music really but i think largely because our school was a very sport oriented school 
um, rugby and hockey were the things. And they, and you know, I think he'd got used to being teased. He'd been used to being laughed at. He'd been used to the fact the boys weren't <laughs> taking it seriously. He's used to the fact the other teachers were not taking music seriously. And he'd kind of created this defensive shell. And occasionally you, you had to really persuade him. You were interested. You weren't taking the mickey, I think, before he would kind of open up and start sharing what he knew. Um, and I, I think I did do that eventually. I mean, one, one thing he used to do was I absolutely loved. Um, well, one thing was they had a huge library of musical scores at the back of the music room. Um, I don't know, he acquired it over the years. Incredible library of orchestral scores, all sorts of things. Things by like Roberto Gerhardt, by Murray Schaefer, by Stockhausen, um, the complete symphonic repertoire, rare Russian stuff that he somehow obtained from rare Eastern European publishers. And uh, I used to try and um, basically bunk off games and hide in the music library and just spend ages going through these scores, looking at them. But the thing he used to do, the moment I want to talk about, is one I have talked about before. He would occasionally prepare us for part of the A-level exams by just pulling out a recording at random, sticking it on and letting us work out what it was. And I, I've, I've described this a moment before. It was um, one afternoon. I think it's a piece he really loved. Um, and he, a recording he really loved, I assume, um, he was known as Minim, our music teacher. He was almost never called by his actual name. Everyone was called, <laughs> called him Minim, even the other teachers. Um, he's no longer with us, um, but he's a very, very, very unusual man. But he, he pulled out this recording, uh, Eric Kleiber's recording of Richard Strauss's Del Rosenkavalier. I, I, I had never heard any Richard Strauss operas at this point. I, I think my father had played me a bit to Zarathustra until Oil and Spiegel at home, but that was it. Stuck this on. Um, I didn't know what it was i just knew it was unbelievable i didn't know music could do this it was so staggeringly upfront and obvious what was going on in the music i couldn't believe we hearing was at school the teacher was playing us this music it was so descriptive so you could always i always kind of felt this kind of waves of kind of you know tingles and kind of embarrassed heat sort of run through my body i could feel my face going red as i listened to it and um and uh, and that was it. That was the moment in which great German romantic opera beyond Wagner, which is part of our family background, the, the operatic world beyond Wagner opened for me. That was what I thought I've got to explore this more. I need to know this. And um, I think I mentioned it before in this podcast. I persuaded him to lend me the LPs. Um, it was Eric Kleiber's mono recording with Maria Reining as the marshal. And I didn't know any of that at the time. I didn't really care. Um, back then, if I wanted a recording, I wanted it for the music. Um, we didn't do comparative recordings. We didn't worry who was conducting or who was playing. I, I would say, oh, I, you know, I really want a recording of Elgar Serenade for strings. And my dad would go to the Penguin Stereo Record Guide reference book on the shelf, and get the one it told him, you know, find out which one it recommended. We go to Circle Records in Liverpool. We'd order it, and three weeks later, um, the music would arrive, and I would listen to it over and over and over and over. Um, and that was <laughs> how it was with this Rosa Cavalier tape recording. I put it onto tape. Um, I borrowed my sister's Walkman, and I just go around school playing this music in, in breaks, um, you know, in assemblies, whenever I had a spare moment, sort of behind the bins, um, I'd be sitting there listening to De Rosa Cavalier on my sister's tinny Walkman headphones in this world. Um, it's lush, sumptuous, gorgeous, very adult, um, very grown up, very sophisticated world of things I'd never imagined or seen or heard, but which just sounded so amazing. And I, I wanted, I wanted to be part of and um, wanted to know more about. And um, it's one of those things, it's one of those recordings to this day, whenever I listen to the Rosenkavalier, I can hear where the sides on the LPs ended. You know, I think a lot of re record collectors of a certain generation. Oh, yes. I, I, I still hear, hear a certain line and I just went, yeah, I went, yeah. wait for the little pause. Yeah. You, um, you twitch to get up to change sides. That I love that. Even after all these years, I still exactly, do that. Exactly on that climate yeah. recording. Well, I said I didn't have to change sides. My dad was lovely about all this stuff. He he, he would take these LPs and put them onto tapes for me. And um, and that, that's how I got to know most of the repertoire. But but that moment, it, it's just the sensuality of that music, the power, the fact that the music was just, this is absolutely breaking through all the barriers, speaking directly to me, making it very clear what it was about. There was no mediation. You know, this is probably the most single, most adult experience of my life to that date was <laughs> hearing that music for the first time. And I, I don't know if Mr. Brown, Minim, um, quite what he started that day. I mean, I, 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 I he died, I think, two years ago now. I spoke to him a bit in his later years, and he, he was quite pleased that I'd become a critic, and he'd read my reviews in Gramophone, and, and I was kind of flattered that he had and, and touched that he had, and I think he clearly felt I was not as hopeless as I had appeared, and I haven't <laughs> really been the expert enthusiast <laughs> that he wanted we, in his A-level class, but, um, yeah. We, uh, we had a fantastic teacher at my school, uh, Trevor Webb, um, who... 
actually one of the one of the things I liked about him was he he let us introduce him to music. So I I brought in my um, multi albums of uh, Einstein on the Beach, which I, I think you know he really really responded to, he'd never heard before, and things like that. And actually, I think that's a great that's a great thing to say about a teacher that they they're not just prescribing; they're they're actually there to 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 absorb as well. And I, I and I think we all got something out of that that relationship. I say when he he left in order to write the uh the, the the textbooks for GCSE music because this was before GCSE actually started um uh, because I, I was the first year to do GCSEs in 1988 um and so it was all very very new and he went off to to do that and when he went off we we were without a music teacher really we had an assistant one but we were without a music teacher for a whole term and uh, I taught GCSE music uh that that year to fourth and fifth years and I was I was in the lower sixth. <laughs> uh, what the union would say about that, by the way, doesn't even bear thinking about. But I can say it now, 33 years later, <laughs> probably get away with it. But it was, by the way, I would say it was a hideous experience. And I do not know how teachers do it. I do not, also do not know why teachers do it. Why you put yourself through that experience. I do not know uh, in front of that many horrible teenagers. But there you are. It was an experience to have, nevertheless. I've been trying to th I was trying to think of composers that I rejected when I was younger and then there was a turning point and i thought oh i get it and there is one and i have mentioned it before actually on on the podcast and that's elgar because i was so consumed by modern music new music for, for basically all the way till 18 19 20 21 at least way beyond the royal academy music and, and and all the rest of it um, and I, and therefore, I, I sort of naturally re, um, rejected Elgar, I suppose. We played quite a lot of Elgar in, in the youth orchestra. We did First Symphony, we did Second Symphony, um, we did Cocaine Overture, um, and so on, uh, in the South, those sorts of pieces. Um, you know, great pieces for, for orchestra to play and youth orchestras to play, get their teeth into. But I, I never really um, connected with them at all certainly not in the way I would naturally have connected with with the new pieces or, or the newer pieces um, and then I don't even know when it was I mean it's a good 20 years ago I guess but I remember hearing Schulte conduct an Elgar piece I think it was in is either in the south or it might have been cocaine and then moving on from there I think it was even on the same album the second symphony which by that point, I knew well anyway because we'd done it in the youth orchestra, and there's all that muscle memory that goes on when you when you play pieces at the formative years. And suddenly, it made sense to me, and I think it was because of the attack. So I've talked about this before, and everyone knows about the attack that Schulte gave to almost everything. We've talked about it, haven't we, Richard? About the Wagner Ring cycle, of course. But there were with Elgar, I think it was pertinent because here you had a composer that so often was softened and had those sort of soft edges attached to it as if this was the pastoral music of Britain um, in the same language as Vaughan Williams and, and all the rest of it. But actually here was Schulte attacking Elgar like a good foreigner would and not taking those aspects in, n rejecting the idea of him being a pure English composer, which I, I don't think he is anyway. Uh, and I think actually, really does him no favours at all in putting him in that bracket. Um, and here was a harder edge to the string sound and, and, and a much more dynamic way of, of, of playing that music. And it, it did it for me because suddenly this music was brought alive and I heard things in it that I'd not heard before. And I started to get more into Elgar. Now, I also wonder whether it's to do with age. I do think there are some composers that you that you mature into. Everybody matures into different composers at different rates in different ways. But I think I did mature into Elgar. I don't think it's a sentimentality because, of course, again, I think that's something that people misunderstand about Elgar is the sentiment. I don't really hear it. I know he can be, be incredibly moving in, in the way he writes. And, of course, in pieces like the Second Symphony, that's certainly true. And I find it incredibly moving now. But I wonder whether I find it in moving now because I'm older. And because I have a wider experience and I've got other things going on in my life, all, all of that, that affect the way I approach it. But it was definitely that Schulte attack that got me into Elgar in the first place. That was my way in. That was the door opening. Having played so much Elgar, and maybe maybe it was all those, and there were a lot of them, um, Dream of Gerontius performances of, uh, with amateur choruses that I used to do every single year, year after year as a percussionist. There are only a few of us in percussion in Kent and we used to do everything, 
in all corners of the county. And uh, there was a whole period where everyone was doing Dreamer Garantias. And then if you were really unlucky, they would do Music Makers. And of course, you realise that these are great works that aren't always served well by amateur performances. And that, I mean, I remember the first time I heard Music Makers live by professionals was actually at Symphony Hall with um, the CBSO. And again, suddenly the piece makes sense because I'm not playing, so I'm not having to concentrate on bars rest and all the rest of it. And also it's extremely well performed and it opens up that whole world to you. So it, there you are. It was a, an, an entire um, output of one composer that was opened up to me almost in, in one moment like that. It's really funny hearing you talk about both Dream of Garontius and the idea of was Elgar an English composer or not. Um, right. It reminds me of one of the, the sort of the light bulb moments when I was still working on the Today programme on BBC Four and Radio Four rather, and I was thinking I should probably go back to music. And one of the moments that tipped me over was when I went to the head of planning and I said, I, I have some Elgar anniversary. And I said, how about we do a discussion on Elgar was he an English or a Germanic composer? Or, you know, how English was he? And the head of planning went, yeah, or, or we could do maybe Elgar, good or bad. And that was the moment at which I thought, okay, I'm clearly in the wrong place here. But <laughs> Elgar, Dream of Garantius was actually one of my five choices today. Um, yeah. Because growing up with Elgar, I mean, I, I always loved him, I have to say, but I grew up with the, the cello concerto, the sea pictures, the enigma variations, and they're wonderful works. Um, and actually, I, I fell for the sea pictures playing it in a scratch orchestra. Um, but they do... For me, at, at least in the past, they mainly painted a picture of sort of English Edwardiana, um, which I don't say in a negative way, actually. It's just that's what they meant for me. And then Dream of Garantius, I actually, I missed the amateur performance with my school chorus. Um, so, but I just, my, my perception from afar was English Edwardiana, but big, heavy sludge, overblown, if you like, a bit kind of sludgy. Um, and then I heard a really great recording and I, and I was, I think I was writing about it for work and I suddenly had to come across it, come at it from an entirely different angle, a professional angle. And I was blown away by this, this mystical language, um, which owed so much to Wagner, the chromaticism, um, tonality really quite ambiguous a lot of the time, a wonderful scoring, so richly hued. It's not remotely sludgy if you're pay playing it well. Mm. Um, the final bars are absolutely wonderful. And it completely rethought. I, I had to rethink what I imagined Elgar was, who he was as a composer. And the whole thing, you know, was he English or was he something more? And of course, it was Germany, ultimately, who gave Dream of, Dream of Garantius its first proper airing. And then, of course, we realised it was a good work after all. But it was Dream of Garantius that did that for me. Hmm. Richard, what about you uh, with, com with composers? Have you got a composer uh, uh, door opening moment uh, on your list? I've got, I've got a couple, actually. I, I was just going to throw out there. I mean, uh, I say I, I, I work... I see myself principally these days as an opera critic. That's what I, I want to do most of all, see, hear operas. Um, that, that's what really gets my juices flowing these days. Um, and, you know, it's, it's such a, a wide, diverse universe there. But I, I grew up, as I said, with this Germanic tradition. There's this kind of idea, isn't there, that you sort of follow this sort of proper progression through the repertoire. You know, you begin with a nice, simple children's opera like Hansel and Gretel or maybe Gilbs and Sullivan. Then you try a bit of Mozart. Then you get to know Verdi. Then you move on. To... Anyway, it doesn't work like that. I mean, I, I, I knew every note of Titoche Stad before I'd heard a single Verdi opera. Um, it, it, you know, you find different things at different times in different ways. I mean, uh, Korngold was an eye-opening moment for me, that the colour, the excitement, the energy of that throughout the music. But with opera, Clearly, there, there are whole areas that I came to as I sort of developed my career as an opera critic, but I didn't have the kind of background in because my dad was such a Wagnerite and I grew up in that sort of way of looking at things. Um, two crucial areas of opera um, were Verdi and, and Benjamin Britten. And Verdi, I'd been told, you know, barrel organ music silly Italian tunes, fat tenors um, playing in football stadiums while the orchestra just chugs umpar away in the background and ridiculous plots, all, all, all the stereotypes, all the stereotypes, which I swore... Hang on, you're saying it's not that? It's not that, no. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, it can be that. Um, 
I, I, I swallowed those stereotypes whole. And I, I actually played in performances of, La, I played in the Sri Lankan premieres of both La Traviata and Rigoletto in the pit as a cellist. And it did absolutely nothing to uh, dis- disperse my prejudice. I did not enjoy either experience. It, these are fairly crude, crude orchestral writing as I saw it at the time, um, sweltering in the Sri Lankan heat with these terrible singers and terrible sets and um, terrible karma scores. And, um, um, and yeah, I mean, you, you, you have to, you know, you have to make the effort. You have to take these things on trust. You have to understand that if a lot of people think something is good, if something has a reputation, there might be something in it. And you have to be open that, to that. And you have to sometimes understand that you're maybe just simply speaking the wrong language. You're not listening to, the, you know, you have to break past that language barrier, that stylistic barrier. I, something I've worked very, very hard at with Italian opera over the last couple of decades, um, breaking past that innate stylistic objection, the idea that the, the, those rhythms, uh, those accompaniments, those stereotype gestures are part of a language which can be understood and read. And actually what the great masters do is, is transcend that. I mean, the first Verdi opera, absolutely, I thought, oh my God, this, I, I see what they mean. He is a genius, uh, was Falstaff arguably the most Wagnerian of his operas and therefore the obvious entry point for me. <laughs> the one that absolutely sealed it for me, and I, I've made a point of going to as much Verdi as I can and really trying very, very hard to engage with this and to take it seriously, to get onto his dramatic wavelength. The piece that absolutely sealed it for me will probably surprise no one who knows the operatic repertoire, which is a performance um, a few years ago at the Royal Opera House of Don Carlos, um, his magnificent grand opera um, set in um, 17th century Spain. Uh, this sort of drama of power, of, of family love, of dynastic struggle, um, and above all of these incredibly power, human, rela- human beings trapped in this powerful political framework of oppression, destroying each other, trying not to be destroyed by the powers that surround them, just some of this incredible psychological accuracy, drama and power. And I, I just absolutely, I felt the shivers running my spine. I, I, I don't mind saying, I mean, in, uh, there were moments in it, you know, but, but by the time we got to a scene in Don Carlos while King, King Philip of Spain is sort of sitting in his study, being told by this sinister, evil old priest that he's going to have to kill his own son in the cause of the state. Um, I, I was thinking, this is this is in the Wagner class. <laughs> I don't mind saying that, and it was, and it's been no, you know, that was that was definitely a moment for me when I realised I'd got somewhere. I, I, I'd found my way into this repertoire. I was I was hearing what I hadn't heard, what I hadn't allowed myself to hear before then. I'm absolutely guessing it. Um, the other the other composer. Benjamin Britten, I mentioned. He's a composer I kind of find eminently, whose charms I find very resistible. Um, I mean, the more you find out about the personality, the, the less likable he seems to be. He seems like a horrible man. He's got this cult going at Oldborough that persists to this day, where you meet terrible, snobbish people who are very, very rude to you. And uh, although the music making is great, I don't hesitate to say the place is lovely. It's, 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 you know, he's built this whole clique around him. He's you know, massive effort going into building up his posthumous reputation, this, um, you know, selfishness. You know, Va- Vaughan Williams famously set up a trust which wasn't allowed to promote his own music. You know, Benjamin Britten said, you know, set one up and indeed set up a publisher which seems to do little else. Um, all, all this stuff. Anyway, sorry, this is this is beside the point. Um, and I, I resisted the music, which, which seemed to me um, cold, brittle, damp, clam, East Anglian, uh, smart ass music, you know. Um, so you know that snobby snobby aspect of the english choral tradition um you know that sort of cold sound of, of choir boys endlessly echoing down damp corridors you know it's I, oh none of it none there's of a it. butt coming right there's a butt coming. <laughs> there is there is a butt coming i thought all of it. um what blew it wide open for me was billy budd um which um, a staggering performance by Opera North a few years ago, conducted by the great Gary Walker, who's now their music director. And, um, you know, I, I knew I'd have to engage with operas at some point. I threw myself straight at Billy Bird, which, um, and there's no getting around it. What a pro, what a superb dramatist. You cannot argue with that dramatic force. I, I was listening to this and thinking this absolutely works on every level. This is an incredibly concentrated, powerful, gripping drama. When it comes to the point, he knows how, you know, it comes to crunch, he knows how to get to the point, he knows how to articulate the drama, how to pick you up, how to pull you into it, how to sketch your characters, absolute economy, absolute power, everything struck home. This was absolute bloody mastery um i think i'd been to hear i can't remember what i'd been to hear a couple of nights before um it was a, another another reasonably well-known opera in the repertoire and i can't remember what it was i just remember thinking they, this, they're like amateurs compared to britain this is the real deal this, this is um th- this is drama and, and i'm feeling it and and it's carrying me under and the fact that i don't like britain i have all these objections you know or you know i've, I've never got on him um all those prejudices i had irrelevant this this is this is fantastic this is a real deal and um and i think you know it's been a turning point for me and it's kind of 
dispels the prejudices, dispels, you know, the, the resentments, dispels the misunderstandings. I'm now looking at everything of his from a different perspective. I'm sort of hearing the freshness. I'm feeling the vitality in those early works in the 30s, things like Young Apollo. And uh, I'm hearing the poetry and the late stuff, the, um, the, the late string, you know, the third string quartet, the, um, the late folk song suite. And, and, I'm, and I'm always eager to explore and to hear more. And, and yeah, I, one has to try and stay open-minded. I, you know, I, 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 I you know, I, I admit to having been prejudiced in the past. We all have prejudices. Prejudices save time. We couldn't get through life without them. They are necessary and vital. Um, <laughs> yeah. But you do have to keep that door open to the idea they're also completely wrong. Um, and I'm very, that. very glad to hear it. My moment. The, the, I'm yeah. glad you've, 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 you've made the turn. Uh, I think that's absolutely <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I, I'm but, still not always in the mood for Britain. I'll tell you that. Just, no, uh, you know, but, the heart just sinks at times. And I think I've got to sit through some canticle, well, and, you know. But, and I find, the, yeah. I find the idea that you, you can mm. absolutely love everything that anybody ever did a bit weird. Mm. That's, very much the yeah. radio, that's very much the Radio 3 um, uh, uh, attack, is that everything is, everything is absolutely touched with genius. Uh, if you're playing it, and I just don't think that's really true. Not and no one, any composer you get to name is capable of of that. I don't think. Um, are you mentioning about operas? I was trying to think about about this too, about pieces that that really made me made my ears prick up and change change the way I looked at things as well. Um, and having had sort of the opposite experience of opera to you, Richard, um, in in so far as I, I never heard any Wagner until I was much, much older. And all I heard was was new operas as the only thing that either I went to or I was interested in. Um, there's a group of three operas. I, I'm, I'm cheating slightly in, in, in this sense, but they were all in the 80s. Um, but they were there a, a few years apart, perhaps. But it seemed like now I look back on it, it seemed like a really amazing little period in my teenage life. Uh, that I went to three operas that really changed the way I looked at opera as well and what was possible in, in opera. And I went with my mum each time and each of them was the premiere as well, um, or at least the, the UK uh, premiere in, in one instance. One um, was Donnerstag aus Licht, which is one of the uh, um, cycle mm -hmm. by uh, Stockhausen, which is, I mean, there really is nothing else like that work and when we saw it when it was done at the royal opera house um it starts it, it it goes on all night it is it starts with fanfares brass fanfares on the roof so you're outside listening to the fanfares going over the roofs of uh, in london uh and then it's this big solid opera with all i mean the production was really weird the, but the music was fabulous and rich and involving and the chorus, which was um, uh, a lot of it was recorded, so it's not played on tape, was just sort of there in the background. It's unsettling, beautifully done. Uh, Stockham, Stockhausen was there, of course, um, twiddling the knobs, doing all the, all the sound. Um, something never to be forgotten, that experience. And in fact, how wonderful it was to be able to go and see a semi-stage performance at the Royal Festival Hall um, a couple of years ago and actually hear the music front and centre for that and realise what an extraordinary score that is. And it's everything that everybody thinks Stockhausen isn't. Um, you know, there, there, there's always this idea of what, uh, uh, that everyone thinks they know what St who Stockhausen is and what he was and what he wrote, and they're wrong almost every time. He loves to make make you work uh, on that on that prejudice. Um, so Donnerstag is one of them. Akhenaten was the other one, which I've mentioned before by Philip Glass. Again, I mean, it's, it's turned out to be a massive hit, and you know, they, they've they've done it. Eno have done it a number of times now with huge success it's impossible to get a ticket to go and see Akhenaten well we were there on the first night and again just extraordinary I love Philip Glass's music but that was the thing that I just that cemented it for me an amazing production as well fascinating production there's so much to watch on on on, on stage and the other one was Mask of Orpheus but Bert Whistle which is another one which just changed the way my ears listened to things because Bert Whistle does that to you anyway with those amazing scores in all the operas that he's produced and keeps producing this totally unique sound he has. You listen to it, this is, could only be Bert Whistle. The sophistication, the rich tones, the orchestration, everything about it I love. And I love Mask of Orpheus. It was absolutely gripped from the moment it started when I saw Philip Langridge grow from um as it were from seed at the beginning and it was such a beautiful move of philip language uh how they performed that incredibly complicated music from memory i do not know but it was captivating again so i grouped those uh together those as as, a, as this sort of quintessential mid-80s experience for me as a young as an early teen 
um, experiencing all this stuff for the first time and just being absolutely uh, amazed by it and absorbed, just let, I let it all kind of pour into me and to see what then came out with my own writing and my, uh, you know, to be inspired by that. But they showed me what opera can do. And almost really from there, it put me off almost any other type of opera because I was thinking if they can't match that kind of creativity, then everything's going to be a disappointment. I, I talked about the the production, I think it was Richard Jones' production of Lady Macbeth Mastensk uh, at the Opera House uh, in, a, in a previous episode as being one of those that really excited me to the point where I literally leapt out of my chair because it was so exciting. That's so rare for me in opera. But uh, I love, I just love remembering that fabulous exciting time in the 80s when everything seemed to be exciting and new and of course it was to me because I was in my teens. Uh, Charlotte what else? My, well my longest running prejudice against the composer I, I'm slightly embarrassed to say was with Beethoven. Um, I was adamant right into my early mid-20s that I didn't like him at all. I mean I couldn't argue with the fact that his legacy was incredible and that you needed to study him and know what he did. Um, I, I think it was partly teenage contrary contrariness i didn't like to like the same stuff that everybody else liked I and mean, the right. best way to get me to read a book is to have nobody else read it the moment everybody is reading a book i i'm not interested and and so but there was something with beethoven it was his language it was to me it felt so masculine it was to me it was timpani bangs severity moodiness you know the the two bangs at the start of the eroica the stabbing opening of number five and um, the sheer chucking the kitchen sink at symphonic form that was number nine moody piano sonatas I and mean, essentially he was the opposite of Ravel and so I wasn't interested <laughs> and then again walking through the music faculty library in Cambridge in the late 90s of course you're also going to come up against across rather Susan McClary's anti-Beethoven rhetoric the idea of you know his music being aggressive anti-feminine reading subtexts of sexual violence into his music and it's sort of what I heard in it too through the symphonies and and the piano sonatas but then in my final year at university I sung the soprano solo in a performance of his choral fantasy and a very good friend of mine um, one of my best friends was the pianist and of course this is Beethoven having a party this was not the Beethoven that I had in my head this was cheeky witty um yes it was a forerunner to the ninth symphony and the, he does the kitchen sink thing but it's it's just so joyous and bubbly it was impossible not to fall for it and so that really softened me but it's still I thought it was just the choral fantasy and then I got to know the fourth piano concerto, and that was it. The, the, the nobility, the, the tenderness, the gentleness of those opening bars, the, the exchange between the piano and the orchestra, the pastoral element, um, pastoral utopia, it's sort of aping the pastoral symphony in a way. Um, it's just, it's friendly, loving, tender music. And, and even though the tone darkens in the second movement, the, you know, it, the piano doesn't come across as the victim and and then it's sunniness and party again for the rondo and it just reassessed entirely my personal vision of beethoven and and it made me then return to the rest of the repertoire with a renewed curiosity and openness and of course what i found there was then a composer who who writes who writes about the messiness of being human who battled through physical disability and personal disappointments to write his music anyway to push boundaries forming friendships writing music that to me is just imbued with hope and determination and i think that in many ways it was both the ultimate irony and the perfect piece of beauty that his 250th birthday was 2020 because in many ways his music for me is the the perfect pinup for for 2020 in terms of getting over just every single hurdle that gets thrown at you and producing hopefully something beautiful at the end of it and if my 20 year old self could hear me saying that they would be mm -hmm. shocked and hurling things at their stereo but that's really how i feel about beethoven now i'm, I'm still waiting for it to happen for me with mozart but, but uh, I, maybe i'll grow old and it's not going to happen um <laughs> richard we need we need to rattle on a little bit uh another one from you um, well, um, I was just going to mention one occasion in my professional career. I, I used to commission music um, occasionally for, for the youth orchestra around in Birmingham. And you listen to music by new composers. And I always, you know, it's, it, commissioning new music is, is like, um, you know, endlessly, endlessly, endlessly trying to find a winner and always, always failing. 
pretty much always <laughs> failing. You know, it's uh, you write, you commission something, you hope it will last, you hope the audience will like it, you hope players will like it, you hope it will become a classic, you hope it will be played. Uh, 99 times it doesn't happen, none of that happens. All that effort, all that love, all that, as you know, and you can try, you have to keep trying. Um, I, I just remember, I, I, I used to get tapes of likely prospects of composers who they thought I might be interested in from the um Stephen Newbold who used to run Birmingham Contemporary Music Group um and was incredibly well connected in the world of, of early of, of contemporary music and I, I'd chat to him about the sort of thing I had in mind about what we wanted to do and looking for youngish composers who I thought might be interesting he'd give me tapes and CDs of people he knew people he'd heard he thought might be of interest to us to commission and I'd take them away and listen to them I'd see if something struck me and a lot of it you can imagine what it sounded like you can imagine you know, sort of, this, sort of two basic modes were very common. One was a kind of endless me- meditative drones with kind of very subtly worked textures. The other, of course, is highly intricate. You know, um, you can imagine the program note. I'll talk about how they've created a three-note um, diatonic cell out of a scrap of a macho plain chant, and out of this have constructed a, you know, what's it called? You know, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah um, so some kind, some you know, some kind of elaborate musical puzzle, anyway, and and you'll think, oh, you know, the heart will just sink, and you know, it needs it needs water <laughs> water percussion, heckle phone, you know, um, it's solo strings, and you think that you know, I thought of someone who could take take the opportunity of working with a full orchestra full of young people and really run with it, really fly with it. And one day they gave me this piece, this, this disc, and um, it had on it a piece called um, Road with Darkness and another piece called Outblaze the Sky, which I'd never heard of. Um, I put them on, and that was the moment I thought, "God, this is it!" I'm listening to a gen- this I've heard a, g- a genius. This is a composer who's speaking to me. I'm feeling the tug of, uh, uh, you know, the, the symphonic undertow, um, the the pull of direction of purpose of a composer who knows how to say what to say and is saying it in utterly communicative, direct, compelling terms. A composer is called Luke Bedford. Um, he's still quite young. Uh, I think he's now just about in his forties. He's gone rather quiet since then. We commissioned him um, to write a work. Um, I thought at the time, this is what it must have been like discovering a Briton, discovering a young Vaughan Williams, discovering a young um, Tippett, you know, just sensing, or a young Turnage, sensing that you're in the presence of genius. This is someone who instinctively speaks through music and has an absolute command of what they want to do, how to say it. Um, And I listened to those pieces over and over again, incredibly beautiful, incredibly powerful, incredibly communicative works, which for me, music has to have that toe, that sense of direction. I I kind of get frustrated with the kind of meditative tendency or the fragment, you know, music that flies into tiny fragments. I I want to feel the, the, you know, that that great symphonic urge, which sort of drove the music of the 19th, 18th and early 20th centuries and I want to hear it made new and I want to hear it understood and this is what he seemed to be doing this seemed to be music you know I, I just remember you know, shivers running down my spine but again this is so rarely has happened with listening to composers for the first time or, or new music particularly and I, I, I thought at that point I'd found the genius I still think he's a genius I, he seems to have gone rather quiet I don't you know one well, can only follow on its instincts. I, I don't know if we're going to hear more from him. I really hope we are. I, I think um, if major symphony orchestras were commissioning him and he was writing for them, possibly he doesn't want to. I don't know. I haven't spoken to him for some years. Um, these, these are, you know, he could be one of the great, great communicators and orchestral writers of our time. And I, I really hope we'll hear more from him. There's a, a couple of quick ones from me. Uh, one of it, one of them is the sort of pivotal moment for me in my in what became my career as a broadcaster. And that was going to Television Centre when I was a teenager as part of the Kent Youth Percussion Ensemble. We were uh, on a, we were engaged to be part of a children's TV programme uh, presented by Rob Curling, who's now a sports presenter. He's also a drummer and he was presenting this, this programme. I think it was called Making Music or something like that. And we went up there. And of course, Television Centre to me was like, I don't know, it was the great cathedral. <laughs> Um, you know, Mecca it was because I loved television and I loved all of the stuff that came out of BBC. I was such a BBC person, never watched ITV, might as well have not had a third button, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, so to, to go there and to walk up uh, as you could in those days, go straight into a uh, in television centre through the gate there and then see those famous spots out on the side of the building with the BBC logo and everything. Wow, it was just amazing. You know, two Ronnies, uh, Morecambe and Wise, Noel Edmonds swap shop. It was all there. <laughs> that was all the, that was that, that great history and that amazing building. Roy Castle doing the world record tap dancing in the in the, in the arena bit there in the round bit in, uh, at the uh, television centre. All of that meant so much to me when I was growing up. So there we were, and we were in TVC One, which is the biggest studio. Um, 
and god i just loved it i mean i was in absolute heaven i it felt like home genuinely felt like home to me and that was the moment even though i'd spent again like going to concerts as long as i could remember wanting to be a presenter that was the moment i realized i wanted to do it and i i did plan really essentially from that moment on that if i wasn't going to be a composer if composing didn't work out i was always going to turn to presenting and that's ex almost exactly what happened uh, in the end um uh, and it worked out but that was the moment amazing what an amazing place and i i'm still outraged at what the bbc did with that building selling it off and not creating something of great history for that amazing building that had produced so many wonderful things. I realized that there are a lot of connotations with the whole Jimmy Savile thing and all the rest of it now that colored all, colored all of that. But what an incredible place for a most amazing bits of television history that we all remember and all treasure. And there's no getting around that one. And the other thing is, um, just very quickly, because it's my, it's my last, um, well, not my last, who knows, it may end up being my last career certainly my most recent bit, which is presenting live, uh, films with live orchestra. And it was when the tech arrived, the technical ability arrived to be able to do it. Um, many people had wanted to do orchestras with live film, uh, with, with, with film for a, for a long time. But the, the technical side of it had been so hard and so difficult to get the synchronization of the music and the image together um, that really no one bothered doing it. You could do silent movies, to a degree, and many, many people have done that. And Carl Davis uh, famously did, did that many, many years ago and really set that trend. Uh, but to do a modern movie with all of the technical aspects of that, to, to synchronize music and picture together, that was hard. John Williams did it with E.T. for the, I think it was the 20th anniversary of the, of the, um, of the movie in 2001 or two. Um, but that was done with Sprocket Film. Uh, no digital at all. And they did it with real clocks and all the rest of it. They did it basically in the old fashioned way, the way they used to do it in the early years of, of recording film music with orchestras. Um, but there's, that's complicated with modern movies, really complicated. We're, uh, we're not talking about a corn gold score here. We're talking about many, many more complicated aspects uh, to, to it than that. Um, and then digital comes along, of course, and makes things a lot easier. And all of a sudden we were able to do it. And it opened up this entire industry uh, that I am now a part of, which is presenting orchestras playing with movies. And I'm very thankful that somebody came along and made digital <laughs> that easy. I mean, it's the same with production of music, production of um, uh, manuscript paper uh, and, and all the rest of it. You know, everything's digital now. Everything's done on a computer. I can do pretty much everything on the laptop that I'm now using to record this and uh, th this podcast. It's incredible. But that was the turning point. I mean, it was a true turning point in being able to actually present these these events. Um, we couldn't have done it without that. Really, it would have been a lot harder and a lot more expensive. So thank you to all those wonderful tech geeks that come up with these amazing things that allow us to do this stuff. <laughs> um, right. Quickly, Charlotte, a last one from you. OK, um, I just have to say, I remember my first glimpse of Television Centre as well, and exactly the same as with you. Mine was from um, the, the Central Line, and I was on my way to my first piece of BBC work experience in London, which was at North House Party. And and it was just, it, it was absolutely wonderful. But on to my final choice. And um, you would think that an occupational hazard for somebody in our job is just weariness, cynicism of, of certain repertoire. And I know we've spoken a little bit about this in terms of the, the works we'd like to put in Room 101 for a little bit. Um, but of course, the other thing about our job is that study produces more passion if you go, when you go back to the basics so often. And this is what happened for me with Vivaldi's Four Seasons. Now, I mean, this is just, you hear it everywhere, don't you? I mean, I think particularly anyone growing up in the 1990s, there was first Nigel Kennedy, then there was Vanessa May. And, and it's, I, I find it funny just in general, when you think Vivaldi mania isn't even yet 90 years old. He died a pauper in Vienna. Um, he got barely a line of obituary back in um, Venice. Um, the reason why we all love Vivaldi these days is because of a conference in 1939 that was mounted by a group of musicologists and they rediscovered his music. But going on to the Four Seasons, um, 
this happened because I did, uh, I authored a couple of apps for touch press and um, the book sections. First of all, I did Liszt's B minor Sonata with Stephen Huff and I wrote the book section for this wonderful interactive app, which Stephen performed the um, sonata and he gave an artist commentary and we had the autograph score and it was full sort of structural analysis and biography of Liszt. And it went down very well. And touch press said to me, do you want to do another with us? And I said, yeah, I'd love to. And they said, well, it's going to be Vivaldi's Four Seasons. And I just thought, oh no, really? I have to listen to the Four Seasons over and over and over again and write 10,000 words on everything about it. Can I cope with this? Um, but of course, you know, I needed the money and, and I liked working with the team. So I said, yes. And and what, of course, I found as I studied this work for months on end was that it's absolutely incredible stuff and just so ambitious and so different and new. Um, what he did from a programmatic um, extent, now the concerto form back then was um, standard three movements. You had a, a two fast movements with a in Ritonello form and then a... Um, slower movement but what Vivaldi did to Ritonello form was basically he did what to Ritonello form what Beethoven did to sonata form um the the returning theme they rarely returned in its original form then while the episodes in between time they were supposed to be for solo instruments Vivaldi would go do you know what no the the programmatic element needs the kitchen sink chucked at this one I'm going to do tutti because people hadn't done that before he had harmonic keys representing moods in the way that composers weren't really starting to get on board with for another hundred years or so um he was playing out the idea of conflict and resolution and um, which again was something that was classical and romantic it wasn't for rock um there were unifying ideas and thematic similarities running through all the concertos again nobody did that back in 1728 um the whole thing what he did was so revolutionary and we just hear da, 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 and we think of hotel lifts and if you go back and see what he's doing oh my gosh this is absolutely extraordinary stuff so yeah for valdi's four seasons read about it go and listen to it and <laughs> your minds will be blown okay uh we i mean we've got some, we have some great stuff there all of all of them have been uh, very personal i i th would like to sort of open the debate beyond this podcast on the thing that is there's clearly signaled a, perhaps the biggest game changer in in the entire industry which is of course the covid pandemic um we won't we don't, don't have time to talk about it here we have discussed it a little bit before uh, certainly in the first lockdown in one of our earliest programs and we'll certainly come back to it again uh in the podcast but uh, i'd love to know everybody's thoughts on how this industry has changed uh, or what the game changers are within this industry um, i'm going to post it up on our facebook page so please do um contribute uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts on that and how you do think this uh, this industry has has changed or will change um and uh thank you very much as always to charlotte and richard for all your memories what a lovely trip down memory lane it's been and to talk about <laughs> our fabulous teachers lazy or otherwise <laughs> thanks again and uh, next week well we have a big subject next week it is violin concertos looking forward to that see you next week <laughs> If you enjoyed the Classical Top 5, please do consider making a donation. Uh, details are always in the summaries of each of our podcasts. And if you want to follow us on Twitter, we're at Classical Top 5. On Facebook, we have a page, The Classical Top 5. Just search for that. And if you'd like to email us, because we always like to hear from you, please do. ClassicalTop5 at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.